Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorian. Now, this is a bit of a monologue and some thoughts about what is historical and what's not historical. This is coming out of the uh, comments and reactions to a video I did recently, which itself with partially a response to Scalagrim, and it was about, is HEMA elitist? Well, that's a whole different question, and hopefully I've kind of addressed that. Um, and obviously there's different elements and approaches to that question, um, but that's its own thing. Now, something that came up uh, in response to my video um, and reactions to it, was that um, some people felt that I was being too uh, elitist, if we want to use that word, but too um, narrow and specific in what I considered HEMA. But as I said in that video, historical European martial arts, so HEMA, uh, we have to understand if we call anything, if you call tennis, tennis, people know what tennis is. They know the rules of tennis, they know the type of rackets you use, the type of balls, the kind of court that's played on. Uh, they know that the biggest championships are things like the US Open and Wimbledon and the Paris Open and things like this. So there are certain things we know about tennis. Well, HEMA has been around for a couple of decades, um, okay, with that name. So I was one of the founding members of HEMAC, the Historical European Martial Arts Coalition. And this was the first organization to use HEMA in its name. And we had a very specific remit. We had a very, uh, we had a mission statement and we knew what we were doing. We were all in accord. Um, and so when we invented the term HEMA, we knew what HEMA meant, and that is what HEMA now means. So the question is, what does HEMA mean? Well, so as I said in my previous video, it is historical European martial arts. Now put the European martial arts aside for a minute, because there's all sorts of questions about what's a martial art, what's Europe, blah, blah, blah. But what we're gonna focus on is the historical part. So what is historical. Well, what surprised me and I completely took me out of the left field and hence I'm doing this video because I didn't realize there was a requirement for it, but it seems that there is, is a lot of people don't actually know what historical means. Um, but quite simply, historical has some quite specific definitions. Now, before I go into definitions and, and sort of pedantry and being very anal and precise about things, we have to accept that within modern culture, within the media, the word historical has been hijacked to an extent um, and is used for other things. For example, a, uh, a historical movie or a historical uh, TV series, which is something set within a period of history, um, but might only be loosely inspired by it. It might not uh, remain very close to the source material. But if we push that aside for a second, in essence, historical, okay, if something is history, it is um, contrary in many ways to prehistory. So hopefully all of you watching this video will be familiar with the term prehistoric. Uh, now, have you ever wondered what prehistoric means? Because a lot of people seem to think that historical or history means anything in the past. It doesn't, okay? So quite simply, uh, Bronze Age Britain is prehistory <laughs> because we don't have any history for it. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, bear in mind, my degree 20 years ago, 20 something years ago, was in history and archeology. span those are two different subjects, okay? The study of history is the study of sources and, the, and archeology span is the study of material culture, you know, scientific remains, this kind of stuff. So archeology span and history are not the same thing. History is fundamentally the study of sources. That is why Bronze Age Britain is not classed in, in academic terms anyway, as history it is prehistory because we have no written source material from that period. So for Britain, for example, and obviously it's different in different countries, but in Britain, history really starts with the arrival of the um, Romans. And one of the reasons that we describe the Dark Ages as the Dark Ages is because we have so little recorded history, that is recorded written sources, from that period. Absolutely, humans existed, they were doing things, they were, you know, creating archaeology. We can, we can be an archaeologist of that period, we can be a Bronze Age archaeologist or a Neolithic archaeologist, but if a place doesn't have historical source material, then 
We can't talk about history because we don't have sources to refer to. So how does this refer to Hema? So bringing it back to historical European martial arts. Quite simply, for the periods that we study mainstream Hema for, we study historical sources, which for the most part are treatises. Now, they're not only treatises. We do indeed have descriptive accounts um, and various other sources that we can draw upon. So when I refer to historical sources, I don't only mean fencing treatises or manuals, if you want to call it that for later periods. Um, I might mean other things as well. I might mean descriptive accounts. So, for example, you could say that the Icelandic sagas, the many of them, which sometimes describe combat, if you're using those as historical source material to help you glean some knowledge about how combat was carried out in that era, in that place, then indeed that is a form of HEMA because you're using source material. So what this comes down to, and one of my objections I suppose, is people calling something HEMA when they're not using any historical sources. If you're not using historical sources, then you're not doing HEMA, quite simply. So let's just repeat that so that it's completely clear. It is not HEMA if it doesn't use some form of source material, because it can't be. How can something be historical if you're not using historical sources? Now, this is where I personally get a little bit even more particular. And that is, some people go, oh, well, um, you know, is modern boxing HEMA then? Well, it's certainly related to it, and certainly there are historical sources for boxing methods. So if we go to the 19th century, or indeed if we go to the 20th century, indeed there are written sources describing how boxing was carried out, for example in the 1880s. So for example, I study sabre and bayonet from John Musgrave Waite's treatise called Broadsword and Sabre, um, but one of his associates was Ned Donnelly. Now Ned Donnelly in 1879 released a boxing manual. Now indeed, if I was following, uh, if I was boxing, I could be doing modern sport boxing, but if I at all studied Ned Donnelly's manual in conjunction with the boxing that I was doing, yes indeed, that would be HEMA. But if I was just doing modern boxing and not consulting any historical sources, then what I'm doing is boxing. <laughs> I'm not doing HEMA if I'm not studying some manner of historical source related to what I'm doing. Now, some people go, ah, oh, but of course it's HEMA, blah, blah, blah. So the people who are objecting at this point, who I think are in a minority, um, what you're forgetting is that we have all sorts of other expressions to describe that boxer's activity. They are doing boxing, they're doing sport, we could say they're doing a Western martial art, a European martial art, perhaps even a British martial art if it's a particular style and lineage uh, that's been around in Britain for a certain amount of time. So there are all sorts of ways to describe what they're doing, okay? But what they're not doing, unless they're studying a historical source, is HEMA. It can't physically be HEMA if it doesn't have some tie-in to historical methods. And indeed, if we look at modern boxing, yes, it's related to 19th century boxing, but the methods are really drastically different. Now, if we stick with boxing for a second, someone could say, in fact, people have said to me, ah, but Matt, if we are using the same types of glove and we're on the same type of um, uh, boxing ring and we're following uh, similar rules, or not necessarily the same rules, because how would you know they're the same rules if you don't study a historical source? Uh, but if we're doing similar things, then doesn't that make it HEMA? Well, no, <laughs> quite frankly, because unless you have a reference point, unless you're able to see in a historical source, this is the type of gloves they used, these are the types of rules they used, these are the types of techniques they used, then how can you possibly call it HEMA? Because if you don't have that historical input, then you've got no reference point, you're just guessing, okay? You're just making it up. So, for example, if two people in the modern world got foam long swords and just sparred, they could spar every day or once a week, once a month, whatever, in their back garden, is what they are doing HEMA if that's all they do? No, because there's no tie-in, there's no tangible connection point between what they are doing and a historical source. 
Okay, now what they end up doing might indeed be very similar in its uh, physical manifestation to something that was done in the 15th or 16th centuries. But you'll never know because you don't look at historical sources. And indeed, even if it coincidentally, so there's a term here called, co uh, called um, convergent evolution, okay? So just because a shield is developed in North America by Plains Indians, and a shield is developed by some people in the Philippines, it doesn't mean that those two shields were evolved in the, from the same root or the same, same source, or that they had any relationship to each other. That's called convergent evolution. And indeed, if you fight with swords, you might find a way of doing something that's similar to something that's been done in the past by convergent evolution. But it doesn't make it historical because you're not using history. And that's what HEMA comes down to. HEMA comes down to using historical sources. If you're not using historical sources, you're not doing HEMA. And quite simply, what are the main historical sources from the 14th century onwards? If you are interested in historical combat from the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th century all the way up to the modern day, if you're interested in that, you have one major amazing gift from history that has come down to you and that is the historical treatises. Now some people argue oh well you know not everyone learned from books or just because this Spanish rapier master says to use your rapier like this it doesn't mean that someone in uh, England was using their rapier like that indeed in fact we know that's the case because we've got English rapier treatises and we can compare and contrast because we study history and we could never guess that we can only know it by studying history um, and indeed you know all of these things are true that yes the treatises don't tell us everything they don't uh, tell us about battlefield um, combat as opposed to dueling combat most of the time and all of these sorts of things there are many questions left unanswered but the fact is that the primary source for studying historical combat from the 14th century onwards in Europe are the treatises. So if you're interested in studying historical or past combat, if you're interested in studying the combat of the past, why on earth would you not study the treatises? They're an amazing gift. It would be like trying to learn Christianity without reading the Bible. Um, yes, indeed, the Bible's been edited and changed many times and might not be exactly how the Bible was in the second century or the third century AD. But the fact is, you wouldn't try and learn about Christianity without reading some books about Christianity, would you? Uh, equally, you wouldn't uh, learn how to decide how to fly a plane by yourself without consulting a uh, flying instructor and maybe looking at some flying manuals. So quite simply, the main source we've got for historical combat in past centuries from Europe are the treatises and it doesn't just go for Europe that's true in Japan in um, uh, in China uh, all over the place okay so if you want to study the combat of past generations look at the treatises if you look at the treatises and learn something from the treatises then what you were doing is a form of HEMA if you don't consult a historical source of some kind be it art or written or treaties or whatever then you're not doing history History is the study of the recorded past. If you're not studying the recorded past, you can't be doing history. Ergo, you're not doing HEMA. What you might be doing is something else. It might be a perfectly good sport, or you could even loosely call it Western martial arts if it's a living lineage somehow, although I would possibly say if it's a living lineage, that is a form of historical source that's come down orally rather than written. So I'm open-minded to that. I hope this has given you something to think about. I hope it's clarified for you what is history, what is prehistory, and what is not history. And I hope I've been clear in this video and it helps some of you maybe view what HEMA is and what our mission statement is. It's to use our primary source to educate us about how past generations used their weapons, wherever they might be from, Japan, Europe or anywhere else. Thanks for watching, I'll see you again soon. I've been Matt Easton and I will continue to be. Cheers folks.